welcome to The Election Show. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer. I'm an Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University and the co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. Joining me today, as always, via Zoom, is Matt McDermott, Communication Strategist and Vice President of Whitman Insight Strategies. And also with me today is Political Analyst and Political Scientist at Columbia University, Lincoln Mitchell. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Great to be with you again. Made it through another week. We, we live to fight another day. So here we are. We're less than two weeks away uh, from the close of the election, right? Since so many people across the country have uh, taken the opportunity to, to early vote uh, if it's available for them in their states. So we're about 12 days away and we're live streaming this Friday, uh, 10 days away from airing on MNN on Sunday, nine days if you're watching on Free Speech TV. So here's what's, here's what's wild about the situation. No matter when or where you're watching this, there are only two more shows before election day and uh, we're, we're getting really close. So last night uh, we had our second and final presidential debate between President Donald Trump and the former vice president, Joe Biden in Nashville, Tennessee, 90 minutes. Um, Matt, I'll start with you. Uh, how would you rank, let's start with, how did Joe Biden do? Some we're hearing, you know, some people are giving mixed messages. He wasn't high energy enough. Um, he didn't, you know, go and sort of make as many, you know, home runs as, as they wanted him to as this final push. Uh, how do you think the vice president did last night? I think Joe Biden did exactly what he needed to do in the remaining days of this race to maintain his lead nationally. I, I think to your point, it, it's always frankly, a bit amusing to hear these critiques of Joe Biden that, you know, he's not high energy enough. He's not boisterous enough. He's not, you know, offensive enough. He's not, you know, loud and aggressive enough. The irony is those are all traits of Donald Trump that no one enjoys. We've had to endure years of a president who fits the mold of that character and we don't like it. We don't want it anymore on our TV screens every night. And so this calm, collected, rational, thoughtful, honest, caring, transparent character of Joe Biden is someone that most Americans are looking for. And I think you can see the results of that in the polling that was done after the debate. Once again, Joe Biden won that debate in every poll that was conducted, similar to the win he had in the first debate, and similar to the win that Kamala Harris had in the pre uh, vice presidential debate against Mike Pence two weeks ago. And so what you're seeing here is a pretty clear picture. Joe Biden has uh, won both of these debates. He did what he needed to, to make his message clear to voters. It's clearly in stark contrast to the message that Donald Trump has been communicating to the American people. Uh, and we'll see over the remaining week if Donald Trump is, is able to really dig himself out of this hole he's gotten into, wherein heading into the final week of the campaign, Joe Biden maintains his large lead nationally, and he maintains a lead in, in every swing state that matters. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, how do you think Joe Biden did last night? Biden did fine. Biden's goal last night was that by Sunday of this weekend, we're not talking about the debate. And we won't be talking about the debate. The debate. He didn't deliver, you know, that knockout blow, that great one-liner, but he didn't have to, and he wasn't expected to. The contrast between their styles is was very important. Notably, the mute button, which you didn't see it being used, but it was used. I found that troubling because once again, the media was being complicit in concealing the degree of Trump's mental incapacity from the American people. So Trump actually, you know, Biden did what Biden always does. He does what he needs to do. He made his points. He, he seemed presidential. He seemed rational. He seemed calm. We've heard nothing from Trump or his people in recent weeks about Biden being senile or too old. And that has a lot to do with his debate performances. You saw a guy on the stage last night who was old, right? This is not a spring chicken. He's got gray hair. He speaks he moves slowly at time, but clearly is not out of it, clearly is not senile, and clearly is up to the job. So from that perspective, it was a successful night for Biden. And Trump, you know, it's the best night for Trump, which is the tallest building in Topeka, but he didn't do what he needed to do. He didn't move the needle on that. Well, I will say, you know, there may not have been, you know, some one-liner that people are talking about, but I will say that there were a few lines that Joe Biden delivered that really resonated with me and stuck with me. You know, when he opened up his debate performance by saying, you know, anyone who has 200,000 Americans who have died on their watch doesn't deserve to be uh, the president of the United States. Uh, when he also said, talking about um, Donald Trump's interview with Bob Woodward, 
and, and knowing the severity of the coronavirus. And he's like, you know, the American people wouldn't have panicked, you panicked. And I thought that that was really important. I also thought that Donald Trump mocking him for speaking into the camera uh, and having, as, as Matt alluded to, a compassion with American families and American teachers uh, really showed uh, this lack of empathy that's just been on display for four years. And I'm curious, you know, for those people who tune in, oftentimes they're just calcified in their own opinions of who they want to vote for. I mean, I don't think that any undecideds are really still trying to figure out uh, what type of leadership they want. Uh, but I, I did think that Joe Biden, you know, sort of held the course. But I agree with you, Lincoln, uh, the fact that Donald Trump wasn't um, erratic and, you know, sort of uh, mimicking his debate performance from two weeks ago, I think that did help him the fact that the mute button sort of showed him to be a little more uh, pre presidential or professional than he actually is. So I'll shift to that. How do you think the president did last night, especially compared to his first debate performance? Lincoln? Compared to his first debate, I mean, the first debate was one of the most strange moments in, frankly, American political history. 45 minutes of this man raving, interrupting, blurting things out, and the mute button helped that. What I, well, Trump's performance last night reminded me a little bit of Mike Pence's in the vice presidential debate. Uh, Pence was better, but what we saw from Trump was an ability to just say things, look in the camera, say things directly that were either strange or not true, right? In a debate on national television, he said, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln, no one has been better for African Americans than I have, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. That is, that's not a fib. That is a lie on, a, on an absolutely grand and bizarre scale from a president who two weeks ago on the debate stage looked in the camera and told white supremacist organizations to stand by. So a white supremacist president at the head of the most racist administration in modern history saying it's done more. So, so the ability to lie was, was extraordinary. I also, you know, if you watch Trump's body language, it's again that that's where you saw uh, the, the erraticism, right? He couldn't sit still, making faces, grimacing, squirming. It was like watching a seven-year-old who wants to get out and go to recess or something. I mean, it was just, it was just strange. But again, by Donald Trump's standards, that's really good behavior. Right. So you know, Our I think been so low. yeah. I mean, the American people have to ask, you know, should we hold our presidents to a higher standard just in terms of their kind of in the moment conduct than we do most six-year-olds? And you know, if you're supporting Trump, the answer to that is obviously no. But for a lot of America. They would expect more from the president. But we also well, need to ask, is it important for voters to hold the president accountable? And, and to your earlier point, Christina, last night during the debate, we saw more American deaths during that 90 minutes than during any other debate in American history. Yesterday, on the same day as the debate, over 70,000 Americans contracted the coronavirus. And we had a president of the United States standing on a debate stage saying that we turned the corner and cases were going down. It's just a lie. And so, you know, we can talk about tone, we can talk about tenor. The president of the United States stood on a debate stage last night and just flat out lied to the American people. We can all see the graphs. We can all see cases trending up nationally. Every state in America is now on red cases are going up across the country. And we're heading into the final week of this campaign with more coronavirus cases than at any point this year. That is the defining point of this campaign. And once again, Donald Trump was on that debate stage and just flat out lied about it. Right, so, so Matt, I wanna stick with you because as a democratic strategist, you know, we've talked about over the past few weeks. I mean, as long as Joe Biden and the Democratic Party can make this election about the coronavirus. They spent, uh, I would say, the good first 10, 15 minutes specifically on the coronavirus where Donald Trump says, teachers, it's not that bad. You know, it's 99.9% it's .9 of kids will be just fine. Is that the right strategy for the Democrats, especially these last uh, 12 to 10 days going in, just to keep hammering home? Even though we know, sadly, so many Americans are following the rhetoric of the president and saying it's it's not that serious and it's a democratic hoax and they hear it on on various networks time and time again um is this the road that that joe biden should should stay on for these last few days of the campaign just hammering home just how serious the coronavirus is and the fact that we need to listen to science and move forward yeah this pandemic and the health crisis that it has presented this country is the single biggest issue that Americans care about and the single biggest difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And by Biden's effectiveness in focusing on this message, 
staying true to this message and underlining the importance of it to the American people, you've seen Donald Trump start to slip up. The entirety of the Trump campaign has been focused on Trump saying that he will not get rid of people's health care during a pandemic. He will not get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He will ensure that everyone's pre-existing conditions are covered. And then he got caught in a trap last night between the 60 Minutes uh, interview that he did this week that'll be coming out this weekend, and again, doubling down on this in the debate last night, said explicitly that he wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, which would take 20 million Americans off their health insurance in the middle of a global pandemic. There cannot be a more stark difference between the two parties right now, one party of which wants to tackle the crisis that we're facing and expand opportunities for health insurance for all Americans, the other literally wants to take away insurance from millions of Americans during a pandemic. And the president of the United States said that explicitly on the debate stage last night. So healthcare is the biggest focus of this issue because we are all facing it every day. We cannot leave our houses without a mask on. We all know people in our immediate friends and family groups who have gotten the coronavirus, many of whom have wound up in the hospital in dire situations because of the ineffectiveness of this administration. And so it's right on Joe Biden to continue to focus on it because that difference is the single biggest difference in this election. And, and Lincoln, as Matt has, has laid out, I mean, not only is it the pandemic that we have to worry about and the health and safety of our loved ones, but it's also an economic issue since so many people have had to spend so much time in hospitals. And we know that one of the number one causes of bankruptcy for so many American families is just one bad illness and a series of hospital bills. So if Joe Biden goes down this road, and if, if you agree with Matt and myself that that is the best strategy for him, who does he need to still convince that this is, this is real? And the way that the president and his entire administration, Mitch McConnell and the Senate trying to defund uh, the ACA, Supreme Court that wants to just abolish it. Why is it so difficult for some American people to connect these dots between the coronavirus, the personal health, wealth, and safety, uh, and, and the future of healthcare in America? I just want to raise one thing about the centrality of the coronavirus, because I agree, that is what's driving this election. On the other hand, Biden has been leading Trump since before the shutdown, since before this became the most important. Yeah. So that's, to me, speaks to a strength, a Biden's a political strength that is very real. But with regards to your question, well, demographically, you know, he's got, I mean, this election, we always talk about the election being about turnout because that's kind of, frankly, the lazy pundit's way to explain anything. It's, it's a nice way to say whoever gets the most votes will win, which is not really insight. But this election has been to a great extent about persuasion. And it has been Biden persuading some people that one, Trump has been, frankly, a terrible president, and two, we can do something better. But the nub of that for me, if you look at Donald Trump's failure, murderous, horrific failure on the coronavirus crisis, there are two components to that. One is malice. He doesn't care about people. He doesn't care about people if they're non-white. Apparently doesn't care about anyone who lives in a blue state, even if they voted for him. And he, what he cares about is feeling good in the moment. But the other side of it is an abject failure of governance. If you listen to his responses last night to any questions, it was always, I did this, I said that, I felt this, this happened to me, it's unfair. Whereas Biden's was, here's a plan, here's a proposal, here's an idea. That's what governance is. And the people who can still be persuaded here, the people who have, were persuaded early, suburban white women, soft Republican older white people, right? All of those seniors who are looking around and saying, this failure of governance is killing me and I can't see my grandkids. So those are the people who Biden has persuaded. He needs to solidify that. Frankly, he has solidified that. But one of the themes here that I would stress is that this guy, Trump has failed. He hasn't governed. And Biden, you know, 47 years, a long time to be in government. That, that maybe people would prefer somebody a little more of an outsider. But it demonstrates, in eight years as vice president, a big part of that, that he knows how to govern. And we need someone, this is the argument I would make, coming in in January, who knows how to govern, who knows how to use the power, strength, and wealth of the American government to solve this problem, make people uh, healthier, provide, prevent people from getting this disease and turn our economy around. That's a governance question. And Trump is an interest in governance and he's demonstrated that for almost four years now. Right, and, and Lincoln, I wanna stick with you because you know we know that so many Americans just uh, stay in their echo chambers, right? Whether it's on social media or whether it's from cable news, um, they think that some people think that the president is doing it absolutely fantastic job, whereas others think that it's abysmal and, as you've said, murderous. 
Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, though, about um, the immigration policy and the question that came up. And uh, when, when the president was asked about not just children in cages, which he completely put on the Obama administration, but the 545 children who have been separated from their parents and possibly uh, will never be reunited um, at all because they were too young to, to, to know anything about their parents. Uh, and the president essentially made the argument that they're fine and we're treating them very well. Do you think that landed? You mentioned suburban women. Um, you know, I've definitely gotten pushback from conservative women who have said to me, you know, when I've made that argument that it's criminal what we've done as a nation to immigrant families by, by forcibly separating children from parents. And their argument was, well, if the parents didn't want their kids separated from them, then they shouldn't have come here in the first place. So we, we definitely have a, a, a serious strain of, of that thought in the country. Do you think that that, uh, that the president's response last night, uh, and if the Democratic Party, you know, pushes that out there uh, to make that a, a real key element in the last few days, do you think that that will really harm the president? Or is it just another uh, insult and a long list of insults that the president has, has done to not just the American people, but undocumented immigrants as well? Well, I would, I would maybe take that answer that in two ways. The issue itself, the taking children away from their parents and putting them in cages, that just pushes people back into their corners, right? The conservatives say, for the reasons you've outlined, it's, it's okay. And the opponents of Donald Trump say, or the critics of Donald Trump say, no, it's not okay. But there was something else that Donald Trump said on that during that time that I want to stress. Because I have written extensively about the Trump administration, about its threat to democracy, but I've assiduously avoided using words like fascism, and making comparisons to Hitler and to Nazis. However, when he talked about how well those children are treated, they've never been treated better. That was the language of genocide. That is the language that genocide dares from Hitler to Pol Pot to Stalin have used. That was the single for me most chilling thing that he said. That is one step away from, oh, those, those people were happy as slaves because the white people gave them food or don't worry about those Jews. They'll be fine in those camps. They're better off there because they're eating better. That was a horrific lie that goes to the absolute core of the, of the, of the core, of the psychological core of the mentality of the person who's willing to commit genocide. And I really don't say that lightly. And I'm not saying Trump is committing genocide, but that theme was there and that was terrifying. And do we want someone leading this country who is capable not only of thinking like that, but articulating that because he knows that a good part of his base wants to hear it. I thought it was the most morally disgusting thing I've heard from a president in my lifetime. And I lived through Reagan and I lived through George W. Bush. Uh, Matt, uh, as a democratic strategist, uh, did you want to comment on uh, that point about the children being separated in cages or, or other chilling moments for you in the debate? For sure, yeah. Uh, and I, I think you, you both hit on an important point, which is just the disparity between not only these two candidates, but the two parties we have in our country right now, and just the chasm that exists between a party that is empathetic, caring, compassionate, wants to do right by the American people, and another party under Donald Trump who has just thrown away any care for the average person and the difficulties and the challenges that they're going through, whether they're American citizens or not. That has been a defining trait of these four years under Donald Trump, is a Republican Party that just doesn't care about everyday people, whether it comes to health care, whether it comes to immigration, whether it comes to education, whether it comes to the economic dis, uh, you know, inequality that exists in this country. Again and again, we've seen a Republican Party under Donald Trump that just does not have empathy and compassion for the everyday people. And I think the good news is people are responding to that, right? I, th I think our concern as Democrats for a long time has been by hitting people over the head with that lack of empathy for so many years, it can lead to apathy. It can lead people to turn off, to become uninterested, to become unmotivated. And I think luckily we've seen a real groundswell against this type of behavior from the very beginning of the Trump administration and it's continued on through this election. I, I think we're all thrilled to see how many millions of Americans have turned out to vote already. We're up over 50 million people now who have participated in this election. That number will continue to rise exponentially through election day. And I think we're set to see the largest turnout in American history for an election. And so to have that type of groundswell reaction 
to what people have been seeing in this White House, I think it's the surest way to clean our system of what's been happening. And I hope after this election, judging by the outcome that's, that's potentially likely, uh, we will see a continuation of that grassroots pushing back against that type of just, just lack of empathy that exists over the past few years. Well, for our viewers, I hope that they, they recognize for our New York City viewers that our early voting starts October 24th. Uh, and so hopefully they'll be able to take advantage of early voting. Uh, we've seen it from uh, you know, so many states across the country and now we'll have the opportunity to do so. Matt, I, I wanna just stick with you before I, I go back to Lincoln um, because we've, we've talked about this coattails argument and as a democratic strategist, as we keep getting closer and closer to election, the close of election day and you all know, I don't believe the polls as much as my, my colleagues here uh, because I do think that people lie. I do think that white Americans will lie, um, some, not all, uh, about voting for Donald Trump, even though um, they'll say that they won't just because he may not be popular in their social circles, but they feel either economically or even policy-wise that they agree with him. So I'm cautiously, op uh, cautiously optimistic. But where I actually am pretty optimistic though, Matt, is on the lower level tickets. I mean, these Senate races are actually making me feel quite inspired. Uh, Georgia looks good. Um, South Carolina looks good. I, I would like, you know, the percentages to be beyond the margin of error, more than say 3%. But uh, how are you now feeling about some of the, the down ballot races, explicitly the Senate races that we're looking at? So any election cycle, what you're looking for as a political party is how expansive can your map be? Because at the end of the day, if you're relying on one or two or maybe three Senate seats, to get you over the finish line and get you a majority, you're probably gonna come up short because you're not gonna win every race. And so every cycle, your party wants to be the party that has the most expansive map. And to your point, Democrats have done exactly that this year. We are contesting states for Senate seats that just frankly have not been viable for Democrats for a very, very long time. In Georgia, two Senate races in South Carolina, in Kansas, in Montana, in Alaska, in Arizona, in Iowa. And so we're starting to look at a map where Democrats are contesting a whole heck of a lot of seats. And, and just, you know, the, the sake of numbers would suggest Democrats are probably going to win at least a few of those. Mm -hmm. um, and so the map looks, frankly, pretty good for Democrats right now. Um, the energy and the mobilization on the left needs to continue through Election Day to ensure those races can be won. And, and you know, to speak to our viewers, uh, if you are not waking up every morning and thinking to yourself, what am I doing today to ensure the win I wanna see in a few days, uh, you need to be asking yourself that question and figuring out how you can get involved. Writing postcards, making phone calls, sending text messages, making another donation if you can. Democrats are in such a strong position this year in part because of that grassroots energy of the party. They have raised just an immense amount of money for these Senate candidates that have allowed them to contest places where Democrats just haven't been viable for decades, mm -hmm. generations. Um, right. We need to see that energy continue through election day to ensure these victories actually happen. Well, I mean, uh, Lincoln, before I bring you back in here, Matt, I've got to say, you know, the, the shady part of me did love watching those excerpts of the Iowa Senate debate where the incumbent Joni Ernst couldn't answer, you know, sort of a, a basic question that's really crucial to, to Iowa farmers. I mean, it was about what the price of soybeans was it? Uh, and her opponent, you know, answered the, the price of corn. And I, I didn't think it was a gotcha question. I think it's one of those questions where the moderator just said, let's get through this question so we can really get into policy. But it did show um, that she clearly sort of entrenched herself with some of the Washington ideals. And I don't know how that's going to play out in her home state uh, because it, it basically went viral. And it, it shows why, why Democrats in particular need to contest every race in every state in every election, because you have these moments that wind up defining a race. And if we didn't have a credible candidate in a place like Iowa, we wouldn't be able to actually do something about it. And it's the right. same with Georgia and South Carolina and Mississippi. It's and Alaska. important for Democrats to run races in these states every election cycle. Right, we shouldn't just be seeding the election. Lincoln, before we go, I did wanna uh, bring it back to sort of a more national perspective and, and ask you a question about the taxes, because we keep hearing the president say, 
well, I, I wish I could show you my taxes, but I'm being audited. He never really talks about why he's being audited, but he says, you know, keeps kicking the can down the road. He promised this in 2015, 2016, and here we are in 2020 and we still haven't seen his taxes. Do you think that that, uh, that, that line of questioning uh, is sticking to him? We know that, as Matt has said, Joe Biden's been able to uh, raise quite a bit of money from grassroots Democrats. He said last night his average donation is $43, not necessarily Wall Street. We know that Trump was, you know, did raise some money, but it was mismanaged so terribly. He's pretty cash poor. But is this tax argument uh, sticking? And is that something that voters actually really care about in, at this stage in the game? This tax issue is more important than you might think. It's not a front and center issue like the coronavirus, but it really fills out an image of Donald Trump as a dishonest, scheming businessman, as a liar who, who is either dancing on the edge of criminality or who is, in fact, a criminal. And his answers are nonsensical. If the IRS is auditing him, first of all, there's no law that says you can't release your tax returns if you're being audited. If you're being audited, you release, and you're running for president, you release your tax returns and you say, I'm being audited. So it's something in here might change if the government tells me to. Secondly, as far as I know, the IRS is part of the federal government. And last time, I mean, according to, to the law, the president could tell the IRS, release my tax returns. So that is a non-answer. His answer got even more bizarre because what he said was that I that $750 figure that the New York Times reported is wrong because actually, essentially what he said is, I paid quarterly taxes. He couldn't remember the word quarterly, so he just said I pay in advance, which is not actually what quarterly taxes are. But that is nonsensical because I don't know, I have a feeling that the reporters at the New York Times know what quarterly taxes are and that Donald Trump didn't pay them. So the tax issue is a good issue because it gets to a lot of peripheral issues about Donald Trump, his abject dishonesty, his shady criminal dealings, he's not who he is, and that there's something more about him that we need to know. The big, the er lie of the Trump presidency is that the Russia investigation was a hoax. Read the Mueller report, it wasn't a hoax. There, so we know that the Trump campaign worked with Moscow in 2016. What we don't know is why. And right. there's reason to believe it's in the tax right. returns, and that's one reason why they're very important. Well, gentlemen, yet again, we have so much more to delve into. Uh, we're coming close to the close of the election season. That's all the time we have. Uh, for our viewers out there, please, please come up with a voting plan, not just for yourself, but for your friends and family. Uh, thank you all both so much for being here with me today. I'm Dr. Christina Greer. Thanks for watching the election show. Be safe, wear a mask, and goodbye.